Hey, so folks, Michael Hellickson here with Club Wealth Coaching and Consulting, where we coach from brand new agents on up to the biggest team leaders in the country, in fact, in the world and uh, in the real estate industry. We're super excited uh, to be here today with my co host for Club Wealth TV, Miss Cherie Benjamin, Hola. rock star of the world. <laughs> Dude, she's freaking crushing it. Cherie right now is hitting, uh, she, what are you on track to do? About 500 deals this year? Something yeah. like that. She's killing it. She's got 30, We're trying. 30 plus people on our team doing it. Did two over 250 transactions last year. Uh, love Cherie. She's a club wealth coach, of course, and crushes it. Uh, also, Mr. And I say Mr. I should say Mr. Coach Brian Curtis, uh, the the absolute sultan of real estate, man. This is the guy. Uh, Brian Curtis last year did over 330 transactions. Uh, he is absolutely the man. He's got a bunch of people. on. I don't even know. I've lost count of how many people he's got on his team, uh, but not even counting the expansion teams that Cherie and Brian are building all over the country. These guys are crushing at their local markets and uh, doing a great job of it. And today's guest with us is Michael Baird. And Michael is also yes. crushing it. And I got to tell you, Michael started off as a pro golfer. And uh, so believe it or not, like this guy can actually swing a club, something that I think Brian's pretty good at too. I, on the other uh, hand, suck at golf. Uh, in fact, uh, Brian won't even golf with me because he knows how bad I am and it would ruin me. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, you and I would just do like I do. We just drive around in the carts. That's I just, all. And, and stop the sandwich girl on the way by, right? Yeah. Wait for him to come by. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good at hailing the sandwich girl. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, that said, Michael made the transition successfully from solo agent to team leader. And now he's a sought after national real estate coach with, of course, Club Wealth Coaching and Consulting. And so very excited to have you on here today, Michael. And uh, Michael, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be teaching us today. And, and obviously, we're going to be dragging a lot of information out of you as well. But yeah. what's your message to the world? What do you what's just bottled up inside you that you got to share? Yeah, well, Michael, Cherie, Brian, thanks for having me, first of all. It's awesome to be here. Um, today, I wanted to talk a little bit about how kind of the principles I learned playing golf, how they translate to real estate, and how a really individual sport, you can take those things and kind of extrapolate it out to a team concept and eventually kind of a leadership role. Uh, so I think we can all learn a little bit from that, and I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot today, too. That's awesome. awesome. Well, I'm just hoping you can teach me how my real estate can help my golf game. That's really what I'm. <laughs> I, 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 I'm proof that that doesn't work. <laughs> no. It's not an inverse relationship. There. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, so Michael, talk to us first of all. I want to hear about the beginning, right? So you know, at yeah. Club Wealth, we've got a tiered system and a tiered structure, and so um, I want to hear about you know when you were in tier one, right? When you were kind of new in the business, zero to twenty-five transactions, zero to one hundred fifty thousand at GCI. How did you get started? Where were you? Uh, you know, how did you, how did you decide all of a sudden one day, you know, this golf thing sucks, you know, cause most people are the opposite, right? They're like, this work thing sucks. I think I'm going to yeah. go golf. Yeah. Uh, you're like this, this golf thing. I'm over it. I got to go sell real estate. How did that happen? Well, man, how the, did that happen? Well, the, 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 th the thing you don't, you don't see, you see the guys playing on TV, you see tiger, you see all the guys making all the money, but the levels below that are the, you know, I call it like the minor leagues of golf, right? You know, it's like your single a, your, your, uh, you're in Columbus, Nebraska, playing at the Elks Country Club. No offense to anybody out there, but um, you know you're staying four guys to a room in a Motel Six. Uh, my last year, I played on PGA Tour Latin America, uh, which sounds great. It's a feeder to the PGA Tour. Eventually, um, I played really bad. It's expensive to travel down there. I found out, so kind of got in the hole a bunch. Uh, my dad's been in real estate in one facet or another for. 40 years. So um, he said, Hey, you want to come work with us, uh, get into the business. And I was super against it at first, but I was in kind of a tough spot, you know, from, from where golf had put me. So dove into it full, full speed. You know, I got my, I started studying and got my license in about three, four weeks, honestly. Um, and then just went in full speed from there. I tell you, Michael, right now, you are making a very hard case for my husband to ever tell me that his dream is to go pro. All <laughs> I'm going to say is Motel 6 in Latin America. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> you know, if you're one of those guys that makes it on the PGA Tour, then you're living the life. But there's a, there's a reason 
you get paid a million bucks when you win because you uh, you didn't get paid a million bucks for a lot of years before that. <laughs> and uh, it, yeah, it, it was a struggle, but it, it really kind of helped me appreciate what hard work is. And, and the good thing about real estate compared to golf is golf. You could go beat balls all day. You could practice, you could do all the right things and not have success. Um, real estate, I feel like is, is, you know, especially with coaching is you, you do the right things. You take the steps, you're going to have success. So that that's, was really attractive for me. I went from something where you put in hours and hours and it doesn't necessarily guarantee success. It's a very fickle sport to real estate. Yeah. Pretty fickle, but compared to golf, not at all. So it was a, a pretty easy transition for me. So you said your dad was in real estate? Yeah, he was in uh, construction. He was an appraiser for 15 years. Um, and he's been selling real estate since early 2000s. So uh, he and my mom, essentially, just family business. Uh, we're doing really well. I came on my first couple months, I was, uh, I was with the brokerage. And then my dad, uh, started his brokerage. So came on with him two, three months into it. Um, and so since then we've, we've been family. It was just the three of us for probably the first four years, honestly. And in, in the last year we brought on, we're at seven agents now um, and, and really started to grow and kind of try to, you know, be more in a management role than out there. You know, last year we, we were 83, 84 units and it was mainly my dad and I, so we were run pretty ragged. Uh, so that's where club wealth has really come in helping to build the, the team concept to help agents out. We have great agents on our team that we love. They're like family, um, it helps them out, helps us out to where we, you know, we can still have success without being run into the ground, which is pretty nice. Yeah, that is a big deal. And you know, it's a thing, a lot of people are afraid to make that transition from, you know, kind of solo agent to team leader. And a lot of people love to say, well, I'm just going to keep it small and keep it on. We, we talk about that all the time on Club Wealth TV. But before we get into that, because I do want to hear about that transition for you, for yeah. you I want to know, what was it like as a solo agent? What was, what was the business really like when you originally transitioned into it. You're working with family. It was kind of, you know, I hear that you were in the business for several years before really developing a team. Right. Yeah. So, so starting out, I think, um, hit the ground running just because I, I had to, um, you know, I, like I said, I had some debt built up from golf. Um, I had to really go after it. So had in my first three months had six closings, um, which for, you know, just starting out, but the first good. two, three months, you know, it was, it was pretty good just starting out. Um, and then hit a little lull, kind of the, the rookie sophomore slump, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, it's easy when, when you're new and fresh to do the things you need to do, um, to succeed because it's fun, it's new. But then when, once you go through a deal falling apart, um, you know, uh, a buyer that drags you around looking at 150 houses, um, things like that, it gets a little harder things start sucking away from you and it's harder to do the things that you need to do that got you to success. So um, first year, I think was around after that first couple months, um, that was at the end of the year. The first year uh, was in the twenties and then just kind of kept rising from there by about 20 every year. Um, so it's been kind of a steady climb and we've kind of regrouped having, having agents now. Um, but the things I learned in those years are, are things that I, I'm teaching to the agents now, you, you know, the staying, staying organized and staying on your, your, your key things that help drive business and not worrying about the piddly stuff that's going to take away from your time, which we all get wrapped up in. So let me ask you, what were some of the things that it took for you to turn, to make that transition? Because what I heard early on when we first started, you started talking about, you know, taking a bunch of swings, all that kind of stuff. And the similarities between being a pro golfer and actually succeeding in real estate. And Brian, I know you'll understand some of that connection a lot better than I will. Cause again, you know, I suck at golf and I really <laughs> I know nothing about golf. So that being said, you know, kind of draw some of those similarities and kind of how that transition happened in your mind and, and in, in practice. Yeah. Yeah. So with golf, it, like I said, it's very solitary. Um, you know, when you're out on the course playing with people, you're people, you're with people, but when you're practicing, it's, you have to stay motivated by yourself to be out there for hours and hours, um, you know, go to bed early, 
get up early, things like that, that are hard to do. You know, it's not a sport, um, you know, I'm probably going to get hate from basketball players, but it's not a sport like basketball where you go work out and, you know, shoot a hundred shots. And it, it's something that you, you got to work out all day. Right. Um, and, and with real estate starting out on your own, it, it's the same, you, you know, the, it, it's not, 500 swings a day, but it might be 500 calls a day, right? You know, it's, it, it's picking up the phone and doing those mundane things that are a lot like the mundane things in golf, you know, the, the repetition. Um, and so that, that's why it was an easy transfer for me because it went from repetitive training, you know, working on fundamentals to the same thing in real estate, right? You have your fundamentals, you have picking up the phone, you have going out and showing homes, things like that, that are tough to do that people that don't succeed, don't do it. Um, but if you do it and I was lucky to see success early on from doing it. So I realized that, Hey, this is what needs to be done. And these are the important things. Um, so it was a pretty easy transfer over. Yeah. You're talking about what, what I spoke about a little bit in at listening age boot camp is that it's that discipline and that diligence right. and whether you have it at, you know, coming someone who's been in sports and you've had to do a rigorous training, whether it is the round ball, which is my sport <laughs> or not. Um, uh, but those things do translate over. And if you can do that in your business, then you start laying down that foundation. Once you've got that foundation, whether it was in sports, whether it was when you were in school, whatever that is, you apply it to right. your real estate career. Um, and I really like that you're teaching that to your newer agents who are uh, young, new in the business, because that's something that everybody watches this HGTV or they watch something else and they think that real estate is so glamorous and so glorious and, and everyone was just, it's an overnight success and it's not. It's a lot of things that are being done that no one sees. So that getting up early is still there. No one sees it. You know, you're doing it. Those making those calls. If I set 500 calls for myself to make a day, ugh, a week, <laughs> let's say that. So let's say a week, if I set 500 calls for me to wake, um, to make per week, then I don't stop till I hit it. Right. And then my next goal after that, once I've said, okay, I know I can hit 500 calls. All right. How many appointments am I looking at making or how many conversations am I looking at having? Once I've made those conversations and I've hit that milestone, now how many appointments am I looking at making per day? Right. You know, that's it's a it's a continuous thing. It's just like in sports. When you first start, if I got out and I decided to run a mile today, I'm not going to make it at all. <laughs> but if I continually do it every single day, now one mile feels like nothing. So I'm going to push myself to two. Then I'm going to push myself to three and whether I'll ever make a marathon, I don't know because I don't like running that much, but you get my good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's a lot the same with golf. You can go hit 10 foot putts all day, right. And say you're practicing, but until you define your goals and say, Hey, I need to make 10 in a row before I leave. Um, it's kind of like you can make 500 calls, but if you don't set one appointment, um, you know, I I'm sure we've all been there. We might not admit to it. I will right here. I've made calls before, where I know that the person's not going to answer just to get my call number up, you, you know, like if I set my goals. So that's when I started setting goals of not just calls, but contacts. Um, and, and that's kind of like, you can go beat balls on the range all day, but if, if you're not aiming at a target, it's not going to get you anywhere. And, and that's the, the same in real estate. Talk to me about that transition. So we talked a little bit about you being a solo agent. So when it came time, when did you know it was time for you to make that shift over to having a team? Um, it, probably towards the middle end of 2016 um, was when first started thinking about it. I think we were in the mid fifties um, closed in 2016 and just getting really busy um, kind of run down uh, the, the, the way we had it set up. Um, my dad's a little south of town, so uh, everything north of town I was working, which was where most of our business was. Um, so I was getting kind of run ragged. We had all these leads that we couldn't work because there was just the two of us, really. Um, so we kind of started talking about it then uh, out of necessity. And then 2017, we, we brought on a, another agent, uh, a, a good friend of mine that I sold a house to. Um, and and he, he was part of the team you know, the last half of last year. And then um, we, we hired on an agent in November. And then since then, you know, we're at seven now. So um, we've continually added on and, you know, 
we're, we're at a position where um, it's kind of that, you know, it's, it's about being uncomfortable and, and adapting, right? You know, and, and we were super uncomfortable and needed to adapt when it was just my dad and I running ragged. Um, and, and now we're a little uncomfortable, you know, running the team. It's kind of a new thing, right? You know, learning how to do it best. But I know that that discomfort will, you know, lead to good changes. So it's exciting. Okay, so here's what I want to, Brian, I want to, you're a golfer. You got to help us out out here, man. So you actually go out, you swing that club, and you also run a baller team. What are the lessons that you think we can learn here from the, from comparing golf to the real estate industry? So I think in golf, obviously I love golf. People make fun of me. My wife, my wife makes fun of me. I, I, if, if I could make money playing golf, I wouldn't be on this phone call. I really enjoy it that much. But I also Me know, too. you know, there you go. See, <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason I'm on this phone call. So, you know, I, I don't need 350 off the tee and, you know, I, I don't I don't spin it back 20 feet every time I hit a hit a wedge. So anyway, um, you know, for here's here's my questions for you is as you go to to do this and, and you know a little bit of my background so i was a competitive rifle shooter so i, w- I competed in the 96 tr- olympic trials very similar sport in that I, it's me and me and me and i get it and so you know when i looked at those things i would say the biggest things that i got from that was you know discipline so and then knowing that i can do the things that i don't want to do because that we can move ahead so one of the one of my favorite quotes is success is boring and that doesn't mean, you know, when we sell 300 houses that that's boring. It means the activities that we did for eight hours a day are often boring. And they're not all boring, but, you know, you talked about making 500 phone calls. Even if you're really brilliant at making 500 phone calls, it gets boring. And here's the thing, the better you get at it, the more boring it gets. And, and that's one of the things that people don't mm-hmm. understand and about success. It's like, I've gotten really good at this. And you see people all the time. I'm really good at doing this activity. So what I'm going to do now is learn to do another one. Well, there is some value in that, but why not just do the thing that you're really, 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 really good at? I mean, there's a reason the book is called The One Thing for all you KW agents out there. It's get good at something, get really, really, really good at it and do it over and over and over and over again. Now, you know, for me, yes, I was really good at, at working with buyers. Then I became really good at listing houses. Now I'm, I feel like I'm pretty good at, at running our team, but it's that constant and never, you know, CA, C-A-N-I, constant and never ending improvement. And so, and I'm sure the same thing was in golf. So, you know, to me, here's my question to you. What's the thing that now you're here, you got a team of seven agents, you're doing, you know, hundred plus transactions a year. What is the, the improvement that you're looking for? Because I think that that's, one of the things that becomes very important and for everybody listening, being a team leader is never about, I sit back and collect paychecks. I think there's a delusion out there that I'm going to start a team. I'm going to give them some leads. I'll give them a CRM and let the money roll in. That has not been my experience. And I've talked to hundreds of team leaders and not a single one of them has told me, you know, I just wait for the checks to so with that in mind, what's the thing that you're doing to push your team forward? What's the thing that you're trying to get better at? Right. Well, well, for me, it was the same things I struggled with but accountability, right? You know, being motivated, but, but sticking to it and, and sticking to the right things, right? Like you said, the one thing and, and our, our one thing this, this past month has been hitting the phones consistently, right? You know, because it's something that uh, it, it's easy to, to say and easy to think you're doing. Um, we, we got dialers that track our calls um, awesome. starting about a month ago. And I, I think everybody was kind of shocked, uh, you know, hey, I, I make calls for two hours, right? And you look at how many calls you actually made. And I'm as guilty as this anybody. So I'm not hating on my agents at all. But, you know, I, I know from my experience, you'd sit there and and you, you make a call and, oh, look, a Facebook notification and, um, oh, you get a text and like, oh, God, you get an email that, you know, something wrong with the inspection. And and all of a sudden you, you've been sitting there for two hours and feel like you've been working, you've been hitting the phones and like, oh, my God, I, I made seven calls, you know. Um, <laughs> so, so if you don't mind, let me ask you this. Yeah. So you use a dialer. Do you use a one line or a three line? Uh, one line. We, we, we're follow up boss and we use the dialer on there. Um, oh, so you're using a click to call dialer. Right. Yeah. So, so it's not the fastest, but um, it's our goal for, for our agents um, 
th this month, just starting out with it, you know, and we may change our goals, but was for each agent to make a thousand dials. Um, and a month, a month yeah, or a week uh, for the month. And, and, and I know that I like that. Sure. He's like a month or a day. I know. I know. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I know that's not huge, but we went from not tracking it at all, you know, and, and not knowing, well, we had an idea, but not really knowing how many dials we made um, to, to this. And, and, you know, another part of the thing is, you know, creating a family atmosphere, family business, right. You know, I don't want to go from, you know, Hey, make calls, you know, call your leads to, okay, you got to do 5,000 dials this month. Right. You know, we want to, we, we want to keep it fun and build. Right. And I will say that from doing that this month, pretty much everybody on the team is going to hit that goal. And it, it's caused a huge uptick, you know, obviously not closings yet because it's only been a month, but a huge uptick in productivity, um, you know, things going on, um, talking to, talking to leads, things that weren't happening as much before. So I think everybody is, is buying in and under, understanding how important it is. And uh, that, that's the goal for, for me as a team leader is to just, you know, help show that accountability, how important it is, but I can't force anybody to do it. Right. You know, I'm not, I don't want to cram it down anybody's throat, but I think everybody is seeing on their own how important it is. And, and that's awesome to see. So, Let me talk to you about the, go ahead. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. So the Dow's yeah. <laughs> I'm one of those phone people. <laughs> So I believe that the phone is the quickest way to the paycheck. So yeah. if I gotta, I'd rather get on the phone and, and crank out some calls than go knock on a hundred doors. That's right. me. So we had a team meeting right after a listing age bootcamp, something a little bit similar to um, what you're talking about there. And I want to talk to you just about, since you're doing it now for a month, let's talk about month two. Okay. Yeah. So once everyone's hitting that and they see that it's very obtainable, what we then did is I said, okay, so let's, Let's have a, let's be very honest with everybody. Okay. Let's everybody be very honest. How long does it take for you to make 25 dials a day? And they said, mm, if no one answers about 15 minutes. Okay. So if you're on the phone for 15 minutes, are you truly having a full real estate day? Are you truly going after and trying to get to set appointments? If it's really only taking you 15 minutes? No, we're not. Okay, well then let's talk about this. So what if you did one hour? How many people do you think or how many dials do you think you can make in one hour? Because me, as your team leader, I'm giving you the dollar. I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm investing in you every month with this dollar. So let's talk about using it now. Okay, so if we did one hour, that one hour, how many do you think we'll talk to? Or you at least, how many dials do you think you'll make? Because remember, I, we talked about there's a progression that's there. And they all said 100. Great. So how many, what should be our goal for the week? Let's give you Saturday and Sunday off from making the calls. We just said Monday through Friday, one hour. What should be our goal? You know what everyone said? 500. 500, yeah. 500 yeah. is what everyone said. And then I had other people who said, you know what? I'm not going to do 500 because I don't have anybody under contract. Or if you're in a different state in escrow. So I'm going to do 1,000. And I've had people who have consistently done 1,000 a week, every single week, and others that have seen that. So what happens is that I love it because we all feed off of each other's energy. So then my thing to you is once everyone sees it and we know that it's obtainable, just the way that we were talking about me running that first mile and how hard it's going to be, and then, then I get it done. And oh, that was easy. So let me push myself to mile two. So I want for you to keep constantly pushing them. Don't just settle for, oh, we did a thousand for the month. That's great. No, keep going. Just keep going. Yeah. One full, let's do that full hour, at least of it. And let's elevate up each time for you and for your team. Yeah, I, I love that. And, and I think you said the hour, two hours, I think that's something we can get better at is really setting aside that time. To, to dial right because we're we, we all work from home we, we don't have an office um, we're all over the Denver metro um, you, you know our farthest agents are an hour apart right so we we meet in person once a week we have the daily huddles on zoom um, but it's it's hard we don't go into an office and and sit yep. there and dial together so it's hard to keep everybody motivated to have their chunks of time um, and I think that's something that we definitely can get better at because like you said Sheree you know you you make that many dials in an hour. If you were sitting there in a room of 10 other people making dials, I, I think it's going to double your rate as opposed to sitting at home and, you know, having, 
your, your wife or your husband or your dogs in my case, you know, whatever's going on. Um, <laughs> <Don't mention these. laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, I think that's something where I, I know as, as a team we can improve. Um, and, but, but like I said, it, it, for us, it was that baby step of getting the dialer pretty much everybody's going to hit the thousand dials this month um, and, and kind of building that momentum um, into more concrete things like you're talking about. So I love that. Okay. So here's, we got a couple of great questions here. Vera Lynn asks making 500 calls strictly from the database. Is that right? From the, yeah. From the database that we provide as a team leader. Okay. That's, but that's what she's asking. So it's, so it's the database you're providing as team leader. They're not calling cold calls or, or anything like that. It's all lead gen calls or are they also calling FISBOs expired you know, and those types of things? Brian. You want me to answer that question? Any of you. Yeah, because just, you do the FISBOs and expires and all those types of things. <laughs> yeah, let's start with Michael. Michael, what about yeah. your database? Are, are your guys, are they calling just in your database? Are they just calling warm leads or are they also calling cold leads? Uh, just, just our database. We have 20, 25,000 in our database. So that's enough for us to call for years. So, and, and you know, we're adding on to that all the time. So uh, that for us, that we don't need to go beyond that right now at least okay so and by the way i think that's an important point that you just mentioned that you could call on that list for years and a lot of people would say oh no it's only the hot leads it's only the new leads that are good but my hunch is that that's not the case for you guys is that right yeah no the the old leads are great because um damon katir is my coach right and he told me the stat i think that 25 or more i don't know he'll probably yell at me for this uh, percent of online leads by a house right yeah. and i think like within the first i don't know month two three it's like three percent of them buy right so it, it, it's those ones that every, everybody hammers you, you know you, you look at other facebook groups i won't name names but it's like you know first three days call them 28 times and you, you know that that's important but um to, to get them because they're the hottest when they first you know when you first get them but there's those people that had something happen that put it off and everybody else gave up on them and, and if we're following up with them to see how we can help um we're going to find people that need help that we would love to help. And so I think it's a, a gold mine. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. Go ahead, Brian, what were you gonna say? So here's the thing that most people miss. In other words, if most people think to call 500 people a week, I need to have 500 people in my database at a minimum. And that's not true. And, and, and you're only talking, I did math, you're only talking about approximately 250 a week. I figure out there's 22 working days in the month if you work Monday through Friday on the average month. So we'll call it 20, just, you know, take a day off here and there, or just the math's easier. So 250 people a week, or 50 people a day, if you have 200 people in your database, you know, and you call if you call 50 of them, realistically, you know, I think I was talking to one of our other coaches, your coach, I was talking to Damon yesterday and his comments to me was it, it takes a hundred dials to have 10, 10 conversations. Now I'm not sure I agree with that statistic. It might be a little bit less. It might be a little bit more market to market database to database, but let's just assume that that's accurate. That means that if I dial 50, 50 times, I'm only talking to five people. And guess what? Now I've got 45 more people to call tomorrow. And then, you know, 45, you know, maybe I got 40 people the next day. So it's not as simplistic as to call 500 people. I need 500 people because it's, it just doesn't work that way. And, you know, you do have to have a system and you have to have a plan in mind. And eventually, yes, you will. So I gave a, an ISA company that I work with um, about 3,800 leads. They were calling about 600 people a day. So theoretically, they're done in what a week. It took them two months to get through those. So you know, six hundred dials a day, and, that, and which is insane, by the way. But you know, nonetheless, yeah. it's a different. It's a different thing. And it, we found lots of good leads in there. We found people who we hadn't heard from. I got a builder who was in there who just I don't know. I don't know if we ever would have contacted him. But you know, ultimately, your database is rich with stuff that we haven't looked at, we haven't talked to, we haven't contacted. And, you know, I'd like everybody to think about this, this whole concept of I need the new lead, I need the new lead is so silly, because think about if you've ever purchased a house, you and your significant other or did it by yourself, you know, when my wife and I bought a house, we didn't look at each other and go, okay, honey, let's call a real estate agent today. 
because we want to look at a house. We got on Zillow, we got on Truly, we got Realtor.com, we went on all these other websites. And it was six, seven, 10, 12 months before we wanted to go actually open a door. And heck, we're real estate agents, we can do it ourselves. So imagine that person who becomes a Zillow lead for the first time or becomes a Realtor.com lead or, or goes to your website. You know, you, you got them on Facebook. By the way, in case anyone is wondering, no one ever logged on to Facebook because they wanted to buy a house. <laughs> so, you know, a Facebook lead may be way up here in the funnel and, and understand that when you're when you're thinking about this. Does that mean they're a bad lead? No, it just means they're not a tomorrow lead. So when you call that person six months from now, there's a much better chance that they're ready to buy a house than they were six months ago, especially, you know, for those those leads that are non Zillow, truly realtor.com leads. So. Yeah. And and to touch on that, I, I, I tell the agents, you want to be the one that calls them when they're ready and you never know when they're ready. So you got to keep calling. And Absolutely. People, like you said, Brian, people will sign up and think, oh, I want to buy a house and it you know, it might matriculate over two years. And if our agent is one that calls them in, you know, one year, 364 days, when they're starting to think about it, then that's great. That works out great for everybody. And they're the only agent calling. Right. That's exactly right. But yeah. because everybody else gives up after the first or second call at best. And so, yeah, you're, you know, it's, I look at it like this. It's like going to Nordstrom's, right? And, you know, Sheree or, or Brian, you know, you go into, you, you go into Nordstrom's and, and you're looking for that perfect pair of Louboutins, right? <laughs> yeah. It, it, maybe not Brian, but <laughs> you go in there and you're I'll looking at that perfect pair of Louboutins. And you walk in and what's the first thing that happens? The salesperson comes up and they say, hey, can I help you? And what do you tell them? Nope. No, nope, just, just looking. looking. It's okay. Don't need anything right now. And then they walk off to the other side of the of the store. And you're sitting there, you're going through the shoes, and you find that perfect pair with the red bottoms and the four-inch heel and it's the whatever so the for leopard print, whatever it is Brittany had on the other day. And uh, and you're like, I gotta have that. I gotta have that shoe. And uh, what do you do? Do you run all the way across the store and go get that guy? I get the one that's sitting right next to me. Absolutely. And, and you and you just grab that person because they're convenient. And that's what we need to be. We need to be convenient for them when they need us and not think that they're going to just come find us when we want them to find us or when they're ready, because it just won't happen. Uh, Andrea Kling, by the way, made a great uh, point. She said, I sat, or excuse me, set five appointments yesterday from leads that have been in my database for over six months. Nice. Guys, Way to go, Andrea. And by the way, for those of you watching, I notice we have a ton of people watching right now. For those of you watching, so go ahead and remember, you can ask your questions, type them into the feed here, uh, and we'll get to your questions as quickly as we can. And also, if you know somebody that should be watching this, that should be learning from this right now, tag them in it. Uh, tag your agents in it if you're a team leader. Tag your coaching clients in it if you're a coach. Tag people in it so they see this post. Um, all right, good stuff. So let's move forward. So uh, Brian Street, any questions for Michael? Yeah, I want to talk about your transition. You came in as tier one, is that right? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And where are you currently? Tier three. Tier three. Okay. So, so those of so those who are watching that don't understand our tiered based system, uh, we in Club Wealth there's tiered based, and of course your coach Damon Damon is a lot higher than where, and he's coaching you um, down. So that transition from tier one, getting yourself going getting your systems in place, solo agent, you move to tier two. Tier two is when you started to grow your team. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Essentially that was last year when we kind of started baby steps on that. So. So you started growing your team at, at tier two. When did you transition over to tier three? Because I really love that you came in. I came in as tier two and then have moved up, but you've came, you came in as tier one solo agent and then have progressed up in the years over the course of the years. Yeah, so uh, switched over to tier three earlier this year uh, after talking to Michael, and it, you know the, I think the the biggest change for me is just the kind of the, the masterminding with, you know, other agents that production is way more than me, you know, and 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 I'm I'm happy with what we've built, but I I know that there's a lot more out there. Um, we can help a lot more people. You know, that's what we talk about is we want to help as many people as possible, right? It, it, it's good for us. It's good for them. It, it's that, that's the name of the game, right? It's a relationship business. So that that's what we shoot for. And, and that's what I love is we're constantly learning at club wealth, how to, how to build those relationships, how to grow that business and how to help more people. So it's really cool. That mastermind is such a key because I remember that tier two, my first 
couple of months of being on there, I didn't say a word. Mm -hmm. I didn't say a word. I had a notebook. All I did was constantly write things down. And then my coach, Brian, I would go back to him and say, hey, what do you think about this? And then he'd say, okay, yeah, let's look at that. But we're going to put that in once you get to this point. But that mastermind, each time you level up to another tier, that mastermind, it's like mind blowing when you hear of everything else. And it's like the secret society. I'm going, well, I didn't know you guys were even doing all of this stuff. (laughs) So yeah, that masterminding is so key. Um, that's there. And it's a huge, huge, huge part of your growth. Um, so have you started taking things from your mastermind? Cause you've been in it since the beginning of the year. What, what are some of the things you're taking that you're looking at starting to implement? Um, you know, for, for me, a lot of it is there's so many good ideas. Um, it, it was kind of like listing agent boot camp. you know, come back with a book of ideas. And, and for me, the hardest thing it's not implementing things. It's not implementing things, right? Because, you know, there's club wealth. It's a wealth of knowledge. You know, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of great ideas and people doing it different ways. And I I think, you know, at at least at my level, I'm, I'm very tied into the day-to-day of everything. So um, until I get more out of that and I'm able to implement things and have time to it, for me, it's not implementing everything. It's implementing one or two things at a time. Um, and Damon and I have been working on that on our calls lately. It's like, we'll, we'll take one or two things, um, to work on and I'm focusing on getting those done and then moving on to the next thing. Right. But continuing to do those. Well, I think you talked about that, Brian, it's not like, you know, Jack of all trades, you got to do something well and keep doing it. You can't do it well for a little bit and then quit and move on to the next thing. So that's why it's hard that the masterminds are great and you learn a lot, but you have to, you know, what, with great power comes great responsibility, right? You know, there's a lot, (laughs) yeah. if if there's a lot of things you could implement, uh, you could crash and burn pretty quick if you try to implement them all at once. So in the face, oh, go ahead, Brian. So I think I, I want to piggyback on that, Michael, because I, I feel like one of the things that happens and it happens at conferences and it happens when you're new to something is you want to take these 27 amazing ideas that I learned about yesterday. Mm-hmm. And then you're like, I got to implement them all. You come home and you're like, OK, oh, crap, I got to work on this. And before you know it, 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 those 27 amazing ideas that you absolutely had to do into into your business they're gone. They're, they're off doing something else because you got to deal with this file and that file and this agent and this administrator, all the things that come with running a business. And so, you know, a couple of things that, that I've found have been really successful is, you know, Michael talks about perfect daily schedule. So putting some time in your schedule to work on your business instead of in your business, you know, the e-myth concept. And the, the other thing is I love pick one thing at a time. And, and again, I add stuff to who I am what our business is all the time. And that's important, but it's one at a time. I'm not going to implement, you know, a a mailer program when I can't even get, you know, someone to call people, you know, we, this, this is not the problem. I don't need more incoming if I can't even get people to handle the incoming we currently have, you know, I don't need to, you know, go hire 30 agents when I don't have any kind of system to train them and get them in place. So, you know, it's first things first, and it's also just one thing at a time, you know, when I go back and I look at our business, I got into the REO world back in 06 and it was the one thing that I did. And I got really good at working with people who wanted to buy REOs. I'm not even talking about listing. We did that too. But that was the thing that saved my business because everything was an REO out there and I became the REO expert. It wasn't my necessarily my plan at the time, but just find something that you're good at, get really good at it, implement, implement, implement. And, and I love it feels like that's what you're doing instead of trying to, you know, eat through a shotgun, which I feel like a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and i'm not great at it i love shiny things and and trying the new thing so it's hard for me but um i i've seen that when i try to do too many things at once and try to implement too many things at once it hurts me it hurts the team it hurts my psyche because there's just too much going on um so yeah that's the, that's awesome advice brian the the one thing you know there's a reason they wrote a book about it so so I want to switch gears for just a second. First of all, Damon Gutierrez, Coach Damon Gutierrez is watching. And shout out to Coach Damon. And we got a whole bunch of other people. Kathy Hoffman's on. We got Todd Strauss, Haley Veskot. It's crazy how many people are watching today. Uh, but I asked Coach Damon, I said, what's the one thing that impresses you most about Michael? 
And he said, humble implementation. And I got to tell you guys, I hear this over and over and over again. It's, if, if, as I look at the, the best, most successful real estate agents, whether it's a solo agent or a team or a broker or anybody practically in any business, but particularly in the real estate industry, it's the humble implementers that are doing the best because they're not out there talking about, oh, I'm going to do this and look at all these great things I'm going to do. And oh, blah, blah. They don't give a rip about that. What they do is they just quietly go implement the things they're taught from people that they know, know better than they do and know where to go. And they just do it and it works. Uh, and to your point, Brian, a lot of that perfect daily schedule is a big piece of that, right? They schedule time in to do the implementation of those things. Uh, So, you know, it's not, you guys, success really is boring. And I'm saying this to everybody watching right now. It's not always the most exciting thing in the world to the, the, the things that it takes to become successful. Being successful can be exciting, but getting there rarely ever is. Uh, and, and it really does take doing the grind every day. And it doesn't mean you have to pound the phones every day. You know, you'll hire people for that at times. You know, there's, you know, but, but it does mean that you've got to, what we call eat the frog. You've got to do those things that you really don't want to do until you can afford to pay somebody else to do them for you. So. It's a big deal. Now, I want to ask you something, Michael. This one's really important to me. So we hear from time to time people that are in tier two and they're talking about, you know, should I move up into tier three? And oh my gosh, it's a big jump. You know, you know, my business might be moving into tier three and I might be qualified for tier three, but I, it's a big jump financially for me to, to pay for coaching at a tier two level versus, you know, a tier three level. What would your advice be to them? Well, the way I look at it is if I didn't think I got the value out of what I'm paying, I wouldn't do it. Um, but it's there times a lot, you know, just the things, even the, the, the ideas that we get, you know, from one tier to another, um, where, where I'm at now, uh, you know, I was really happy before. Right. And I was like, ah, you know, I want to pay more and whatever, but it's, ah, it's going to help the business. It's going to help things. And, and you do it. And it's, it's one of those things you have to, you have to do to know, right? Because I thought, well, God, all the, you know, all the, on the tier two mastermind calls, just so much knowledge, you know, I would, like, like you, Shri, I could pen and paper and write things down and have all these ideas. And then you go to the next level of the tier three and it's just, it's next level. That's the best way to describe it. You know, it's, it's hard to put a finger on like one thing, but I'm, I'm really glad I did it. Yeah. It's, it's funny how, you know, you never realize what's there until you're there. And then when you're there, you're like, oh my gosh, like, this is mind blowing. I don't know. How, how am I going to implement all this? How am I going to yeah. do this? And, and yet you find a way. And as you just take that one thing at a time and you get it implemented, all of a sudden big things happen. So yeah. good stuff. All right. Go ahead. What were you going to say? I was agreeing. Oh, gotcha. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Good stuff. All right. So we're running out of time. We've only got uh, about 10 minutes left here before you got to wrap up. And I see that we've got people that are chiming in here and I appreciate your questions, you guys. Um, and it, Michelle's like, what Brian just said is super powerful. I need to re-listen to that a hundred times. I love it. That's awesome. All right. So here's what I want to know. What's your advice to everybody that's watching right now that is questioning whether or not they should build a team. And I ask this question a lot because I feel so strongly about teams, but Michael, what would your advice to them be? Um, For for me, it's really been rewarding because, you know, at least the team members we have now, it's like a family. Um, And it takes real estate from, if you're doing it on your own, um, the the way I've, I've looked at it, at least recently, is that if you're doing it on your own and you're successful, you could do it that way until you die. You, you know, nothing, you, you might be, you know, I'm 33. I might be doing it till I'm 85, you know, because <laughs> it, you, you could be as successful as you want, but you're the one that drives everything. Right. And, and so for me, building the team is, is bringing other people in. Um, you know, we've done it differently than a lot of people try to m- make the team people that kind of start with personality that fits first um, and, and build off that. And, and, and it's all people, it's worked really well for us because everybody's awesome. Um, everybody does a great job and it, it, it really drives that family feeling home to where I enjoy being around them. I enjoy talking to them. Um, I enjoy helping them succeed. And, and, and I know they enjoy when overall we succeed. Um, and, and so it's, it's really, Hey, I could do it on my own and <clears throat> excuse me, keep a hundred percent everything. And, you know, 
keep trying to do more, but there's a ceiling, right? You, you know, if you're doing it on your own, there's a ceiling and you start driving yourself into the ground, working so hard, running around, doing everything that your clients suffer because you're not, because you're doing too much um, and it's not fair to them. And it's not fair to you as an agent because you could do it till you're 85. And you, you know, there's always, it's always you, you can't go on vacation, you can't do anything. Um, and, and with the team, you can still help people. Um, you can still help people succeed. You can still succeed, but it gives you room to breathe. Yeah, that's huge. I hear, I love what you said about family and I love that your, your first thoughts and your, in your comments didn't go to money. Although we all know that definitely as you build a team and whether you're on a team or building a team, right? It doesn't matter if you're the team leader or a member of the team team members at as a whole make more money than solo agents. I mean, it just, they just do. And they have a better life in the process. Uh, and so, but what I really heard you talking about was family and how your team is like a family. Uh, and so I, that, that to me is really important. I think that culture is the piece that a lot of people miss. They forget that, you know, people might be attracted to your team for a lot of reasons. Maybe it's leads, maybe it's support, it's leadership, maybe it's whatever. But that culture is what will keep them there. That culture is what's going to decide whether they stay or go. It's not. It's almost never the money. In fact, I talked to somebody yesterday, uh, and I won't tell you who because it's Frank Klesitz. Um, but uh, I was talking to this guy, and uh, and he says, you know, I hire everybody at minimum wage. Everybody said I used to hire people at seventy thousand dollars a year, professional marketers at seventy thousand dollars a year. Now I hire everybody at minimum wage. And I said, what? Are you kidding me? Why? Like why? He says because I figured out that. It didn't matter. It does. It didn't matter if I hired people at seventy thousand dollars a year. If I had them at minimum wage, I was I was getting great people at both levels. So why pay seventy thousand dollars when I get them at minimum wage? So he starts hiring them minimum wage, and he trains them up. And he said the skill level is the same, and I had to train them either way. And only he was bitter about having to train somebody at uh, at seventy thousand dollars a year when he wasn't uh, bitter about it if they were minimum, you know, starting at minimum wage. And now he trains them up to be these great uh, members of his team. But here's the thing I noticed when I was in his office yesterday. Tara and I spent quite a bit of time in his office yesterday, and what I noticed was the culture on that team was fantastic. The culture was wicked strong, and people don't leave that team. He's got people that have been there for years making minimum wage. I kid you not. Now he's got people that make more than that, of course, um, but they they all started at minimum wage. So money isn't the issue, it, and it's funny. It seldom is. People always think that it is. It's like when they go on listing appointments. Oh my gosh, who's going to list with me at seven percent? Who's going to list with me with a twelve month agreement or anything? That? Nobody. That's not the issue. Oh, but I'm competing against a one percent fee company or whatever. It doesn't matter. That's not what's important. What's important is the value that you bring. That's what people are buying. Price is only an issue in the absence of value. And that goes for your team as well. So, all right. So in the last couple of minutes here, we've got literally five minutes left. I want to find out something from each one of you. Uh, number one, what is the? what do you think about the market shifting? Is it happening? And if it's happening, how do we respond to it? Anybody? <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead. I, I, I think, um, you, you know, a lot of our business is, is buyer driven. Um, so we're hurt by this market, you know, as good as it is. Um, it's just the, the way we kind of set up our business from the beginning and, you know, we're shifting into more listings, things like that. But I, I think it is just with interest rates going up, I think people are, are going to slowly be able to afford less. And, you know, we're, we're in Denver here. We'll see, 15, 20 offers on a property. Um, I, I see that slowing down. I hope it does, um, you know, for, for, for the sake of people trying to buy a house, because if you graduate college with a master's degree in, in Denver, you, you can't live here, you know? Um, so it, I hope it's shifting. I, I think it has to. Um, and, and like you've talked about, Michael, when it does, it's going to go, you got to provide more value, right? Because you can't just stick a sign in the yard and, and have a house sell in, in, in a day. Um, you you got to let people know what you're going to do to work for them and hustle for them. And that becomes even more important. So for, for good agents, uh, it, when the market shifts, I think it's a, I think it's a plus. It's easier for buyers to get houses. It's easier to, you know, sell with what you're worth, what, you know, what you're going to do for the, for the customer. So I love it. You know, I coach people in a ton of different markets, so that are very different from my market. 
So we've got people who are in Silicon Valley area who house goes on the market, it's gone and it's $2 million and it's a $65,000 Atlanta house, but it's $2 million there. And we've got others that are in such a low inventory place that it's so hard. They're heavily for buyers. So I think that the market shift, is it happening? Can we see it? Yeah, rates are going to go up. You know, some things will start to slow down. But when I got into the business, the rate was 7.7. It went, it dropped below 8%. And I remember when it dropped below 8%, we started hitting the phones hard because it was 7.75 and everybody needs to buy that it's 7.75 <laughs> or refinance or do something at 7.75. And it was still a great market. Um, and we still sold a lot of homes and, and it doesn't slow down. I want for a lot of people, they have these little monkeys on their shoulders and they think this and they let these little negative thoughts that you hear around start jumping into your brain. And I want you to just take it and throw it away. Because when I got, if today's market is fantastic to me because we used to have to buy houses at 8%. So it's a huge difference. Some markets, yes, you're going to be in more of a seller driven. Some of them are more buyers, you know, heavy, but it, it doesn't matter. Adapt to what you have right now. What I love about Club Wealth is that we're going to give you the tools no matter which market you're in. It's just up to you in order to apply them. Yeah. I actually really love it when the market sucks. I think it's the best market ever because, you know, it's funny when I got into the business, it's, and I don't, I don't know what the interest rates were. Somebody told me it was like 14% or something like that. And because, you know, I'm as old as dirt apparently. This is a dinosaur. But, um, but the reality is I didn't know for the first couple of years, I didn't care what the interest rates were. That's the stuff the lenders deal with. Like, I don't care. My job is to go out and put deals together and I'm going to go put them together. I'm going to figure it out. And I did. And, and oh my gosh, I actually made a great living. And then in 2000, you know, you know fast forward a couple of decades. Wow. That, now I'm really sounding old. Uh, fast forward a couple of decades to 2007 when the market crashed. Oh my gosh, guess what? All of a sudden, all the weak agents got out of the business and I went out and I bought up all their lead sources. And so now I had all the best lead sources and I got them for less because the, the people that were selling these leads knew they couldn't sell them for as much as they once could. So I was getting discounts on the best lead sources out there. I bought every freaking one of them and all of a sudden, boom, I'm off to the races. Now everybody wanted to be on my team because I had all the best leads. Uh, and so you know, I look at this market shift coming up as the best thing that's ever happened to teams. I think it's great. We're out of time, you guys. We got time for a 15 minute parting thought from each one of you, or 15 seconds, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> parting thought from each one of you. Uh, so, very, very quickly, uh, we'll start with uh, Sheree Benjamin, ladies first, and then Brian, and then Michael, and then I'll wrap it up. Well, Michael, I love what you're doing. I have something very similar uh, to that where we're very wide, also. We don't always see each other all the time, but we've built this great. Um, culture. And that's what we lead first. So we're only bringing on people who we know that are going to be a good fit for us. So I really do love that. I love that you've gone up in the tiers. And so, and you have leveled up each time. So each time that you've had that conversation with Helixon, you've leveled up each time, you know, so you're constantly pushing yourself, which is what a leader does because then your agents are going to continue to do the same thing. So yep. it's been fantastic having love you it. on. Thank love you. it. Brian. So I didn't get to talk about shifts, so I'll talk about it real quick. Stop it. So <laughs> control the controllables. Don't worry about the things you have no idea that you can possibly predict. If anybody can predict when the market's going to shift and how much it's going to shift, please call me. I'll write you a big check and we'll both become exceedingly wealthy. <laughs> And you said something, Michael, and Mike and Michael Baird, and I'm going to pick on you a little bit. You know, when the market shifts, we have to be better. Don't be better now. And there's no reason to be better because the market's harder. Be your best today. And I'm not saying that you we all don't have room for improvement, but don't be crappy because the market's easy. And I know that's not what you're saying, but I feel like a lot of agents out there aren't looking for ways to get constantly better, get constantly better. When the market shifts, you'll be the best and who cares? So yeah, that's brilliant. I love stop. it. Michael, your parting thought. Yeah, totally agree, Brian. Uh, thanks for having me on it. it, it it's been awesome. I, I think the, the main thing I hope everybody gets from this is, you know, um, what I took from golf, it was, was discipline. And in real estate, that's huge sticking to your important things. Um, and as far as building a team, the way we've done it is just with great people that, um, you know, we, we, 
started with a lot of agents that were brand new um, who had really big success success right away um, because they liked the atmosphere and felt comfortable. And so I think that's huge. You, you know, you don't have to run your team like a, a dictatorship or, a, you know, a evil corporation, so to speak. It can be a family atmosphere and still be really successful. So that's, that's what I love about what we're doing. And I hope we keep it that way. I love it. And that's the difference between being a team manager and a team leader, right? It's like, this isn't about team management. It's about team leadership and right. leaders lead, you know, and people follow leaders because the leaders have the team's best interest at heart. You guys, I love this. You guys, seriously, great call today. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. We do need to go. We got to get on the coach's call. Uh, and so thank you. Thank you, everybody. And for those of you that are watching, we really appreciate it. And do me a favor. Seriously, please share this with someone that you know. Uh, and please uh, shout out, you know, to our sponsor, Wise Hire. If you guys haven't tested out Wise Hire yet, give them a try. We love them. We're consistently hiring people out of Wise Hire ads. Uh, and uh, if you haven't, uh, if you don't know how to get a hold of Wise Hire, just go to clubwealth.com forward slash W I Z E H I R E, Wise Hire. And uh, we'll see you on the next Club Wealth TV. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot. Don't forget. For those of you that are watching this, if you would love to do a call with one of us or one of our other coaches at Club Wealth, that produces at a higher level than you do, go to clubwealth.com forward slash strategy session. That's www.clubwealth.com forward slash strategy. Oops, I got to spell strategy right. S E S S I strategy session. Go to clubwealth.com forward slash strategy session. Sign up. We'll do a free call with you. It's a 55 minute call. We'll look at where you're at in your business now, where you're trying to go, and we'll build your roadmap on how to get there, whether you end up coaching with us or not. So, that being said, have a great day, everybody. We appreciate you watching today. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Have a good one.